to the CCSD School Board Candidate Forum. We're happy that you're here. I am Paula Eggleson. I am the president of the Charleston Area League of Women Voters, and we are pleased that we have so many nonprofit organizations that are co-sponsoring this event. Our partnerships are very important to the League. Voting is very important to the League, and if you haven't registered to vote, um, there is voter registration materials as you entered uh, the building, the sanctuary, uh, to your left. Because of the storms, we have an extension of an extra week for voter registration. So I will be back there after the event tonight and will be willing to collect any voter registrations. I want to welcome Raphael James, our moderator tonight from Channel 5. Um, he has graciously accepted the invitation to moderate, and we thank you very much. Thank you, and good evening. It is my pleasure to be here and to see your faces and to hear from our candidates for office in the Charleston County School District. Uh, before we get started, though, there are a few things that I would like to mention. Uh, first of all, thank you for your presence here. And again, for those of you who are seated, seated in the back, if you wouldn't mind coming just a little bit closer, you know, I, I can't really see everybody. If you could come up just a little bit closer. Um, there are many organizations, as Ms. Eggleston and I alluded to that are part of this forum. I'd like to enumerate them here. The League of Women Voters of the Charleston area, the Charleston chapter of the Lynx Incorporated, Gamma Chi Omega chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, the Charleston Alumni chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, Charleston chapter of the Panhellenic Council, Charleston chapter of the NAACP, Gamma Lambda Boule of the Sigma Pi Phi Fraternity, Charleston section of the National Council of Negro Women, Be the Ones and our host church, the Greater St. Luke African AME Church. Audrey Lane is our timekeeper tonight. Audrey, you wanna wave your hand, let them know. Can everybody see Audrey? More importantly, can the candidates see Audrey? Because when your time is up, she's going to give you a warning of 30 seconds. She'll hold up that sign and then a stop sign or a time expired sign, if you will. And at that point, you should stop speaking. The forum is being live streamed on the League's YouTube channel and being recorded and it will be uploaded to their page, their website later so that interested voters can see it. Now, the recordings are the property of the League of Women Voters and you must obtain permission to use it elsewhere. Now, this candidate forum, and I'm getting to the point, it is not a debate. It is a forum. It is an opportunity to share your platform with the members of the community. The sponsors of the event, nonpartisan, and this is a nonpartisan event. On November 5th, in just a little while, Charleston County voters in four districts will get to choose who represents them on the school board. Only voters in Charleston County Districts 2, four, six, and eight will be able to vote for school board trustees. We encourage voters to visit the League of Women Voters website, womenvoters411.org, uh, to find information on tonight's candidates and any other candidates who are running in other races. Keep checking back on vote411.org. Can everybody hear me? Can you say vote411.org so I can make sure? Vote See, I didn't hear the people in the back back there. What is it? Vote. Vote Thank you. Okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, and now we turn our attention to the candidates. Give them all a round of applause as we introduce them. In alphabetical, in alphabetical order and by district, these are the candidates for Charleston County School Board. You start in District 2 with Carolina Jewett, who isn't here tonight, Ed Kelly, who just came in. Uh, Mr. Kelly, can you say hi to me in your microphone? We just want to make sure it works before we get started. 
All right, there's a button on it you have to press. Make sure it's green. The green light works. Very good. Thank you, sir. Good evening. District 4, Mr. Kevin Hollinshed. Uh, Craig Logan. Good evening. All right. District 6, Mr. Darren Calhoun. Darren Lee Calhoun. Peace. Michelle Lieber, who is not here tonight. Uh, Samuel Watley II, who is not here tonight. Uh, District 8, Ms. Darlene Dunmeyer Roberson. And Michelle Faust, along with Charles Glover. Thank you very much for being here with us. Here are the guidelines, the rules. Candidates will respond to questions in rotating alphabetical order by last name. We won't be going by district. For example, for the candidate opening statements we're getting ready to do, it'll be Mr. Calhoun. We'll start with you first and then Ms. Dunmire Robeson. We'll proceed in alternating order through the questions. Closing statements will be in reverse alphabetical order. No questions will be asked by the moderator, me, that are directed at only one candidate or that are of a personal nature. Every candidate has 60 seconds. How many? 60 seconds to make opening and closing statements. A sponsor volunteer will read the opening statements. Uh, well, we don't have those opening statements, or do we? All right, so Ms. Jewett and Ms. Lieber, they are not here, so we will go on. Candidates have 90 seconds to respond to questions, if time permits. I'm sorry, we do have a statement from Ms. Jewett. Oh, we did get one. Yes, I have it. Okay, well, we'll make uh, allowances for that to be read. Um, rebuttal time. This is different. Um, you'll have 90 seconds to make your case. If there is something you want to respond to, when it's your turn to speak again, you use that 90 seconds to respond. So you're going to have to prioritize your answers. There are sheets of paper in front of you so you can write down and take notes of what you want to come back to. But how you use your 90 seconds is going to be up to you. We ask the candidates use closing statements to summarize the issues they've already discussed and their vision for the position that they seek. Everybody ready? All right. Here we go. We'll start with uh, Mr. Calhoun uh, for your opening statement. All right. Good day, everyone. My name is Darren Lee Calhoun II. I am running for the Charleston County School Board, District 6. I am the incumbent in the seat, and I definitely want to say thank you for coming out today. This is very important. Um, over the last two years, we've done some, so many great things through all the dysfunction. So many great things. Um, however, we need to be better. We absolutely need to be better. Um, we have raised the salaries for teachers as well as the classified staff. We've made some great hires within the district. However, right now, it is important that we flip this board and actually get some work done for Charleston County School District. I'm tired. I am absolutely tired. And at this point, we need to go move forward and make this district as great as we can make it be. Thank you. Governance, oversight, and accountability. Those are the responsibilities of a trustee and the Charleston County School Board. Good evening, everyone. I am Darlene Dunmire Roberson, and I am the incumbent for District 8. I represent the sensational constituents of the Sea Islands. Thank you for coming tonight and thank you for the invitation. I look forward to engaging in a meaningful conversation and talking about some high level questions. I would like to share with you my platform about literacy, retaining and recruiting high quality teachers, as well as continuing to close the achievement gap. Thank you. Hi, I'm Michelle Faust. I'm running for uh, District 8, and I currently live on Johns Island with my husband and son. 
I'm a quality engineer, and I have spent the past 12 years volunteering outside of my professional work as a school improvement council, PTA person, chaired numerous committees for the district um, as to represent D9, which is our um, Johns Island. And in those uh, numerous committees that I've chaired, we've gained many, many educational outcomes for kids. Opportunities, access, and opportunities to things that we didn't have. I'm running um, for the seat because for the past two years, that momentum has slowed down in, my, in this district, and I'd like to get back to picking up the pace. Good evening. My name is Reverend Charles Glover Sr. I personally serve in the 7th Episcopal District. I'm a candidate for District 8. I've served presently in Charles County School District as constituent board chair for the past 10 years. Uh, my reason for running for this seat is, is because of you have the ELA, you have mathematics that the children are actually feeling. We have uh, the college courses that's been given and um, I feel that we need to get more qualified teachers into the school that's really concerned about our kids' education than not for a paycheck. And that's something that we really need to focus on. And mental health is one of the main things that I really want to bring to the forefront because it matters a lot. Thank you. And before we go to Mr. Holland, should I ask all the candidates to turn your microphone off after you're done with your uh, remarks to cut down on some of the feedback. Mr. Hollinshed. Moving forward, experience matters. Hi, I'm Kevin Hollinshed. Uh, many of you know of me and know of my family and our rich, rich history in Charleston County Schools. Well, I can say up here today, I'm a parent of three, a widow. My wife, Monica, was an award-winning teacher of Channel 5 in education back when she was a teacher at Mitchell Elementary in fourth grade. My sister, Karen, took E.B. Ellington from a failing school to a great school. So I also worked in the system as a student concern specialist, 30 seconds. So anyway, I'm here to tell you, I learned my experience as a board member as basically in the past, and Lisa Green is here, and Lisa King is here, one of my former board members, can tell you, even though we didn't agree with each other, we had a business civilly within the boardroom. So again, Look at one with experience and knows how to move things forward. Our district is moving forward in great strides now. Let's all pull together. And Ms. Jewett, a representative for Ms. Jewett. I'm Patricia White, and I'm representing Carolina Jewett. If you wouldn't mind coming up here, we'll make a microphone available for you. <clears throat> All right. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here tonight. I send regrets that I cannot be with you tonight. I am overseas to attend a family wedding that was planned over six months ago. Thank you for the opportunity to share this statement. My name is Carolina Jewett, and I'm running for the Charleston County School Board District 2 because, like many of you, I believe in the power of edu public education to shape our children's future and our community's success. As a mom, I made a deliberate choice to raise my kids in a neighborhood where public schools are central to their education. As a wife, I prioritize my family in every decision I make. And as a former corporate executive, I understand the importance of objective strategy and accountability. But most importantly, I'm a public school parent, public school parent who is deeply concerned about the direction our school board has taken. I don't claim, right now it feels like our Charleston County School Board has become more unpredictable and less transparent with too much focus shifting away from what really matters, our children's education. Some members seem to be prioritizing other agendas and that's why I'm running, to focus on what's more, most important, our students, teachers, and classrooms. I don't claim to have all the answers, but I know how to ask the right questions, gather advice from experts, and make informed decisions based on facts and transparency. And that is time. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kelly. Uh, good evening, sir, and, and, and thank you to those who have put on this event. Um, an opportunity to hear from candidates directly uh, benefits all voters. Uh, so genuinely, thank you for that. Uh, my name is Ed Kelly. I currently represent um, District 2, which is essentially McClellanville, Awanda, a vast majority of Mount Pleasant, especially to the east, both of the 
islands down into Old Town. As you've heard tonight already in the opening statements, the board has made phenomenal strides from teacher pay, teacher bonuses, student achievement is up. I'm running again to make sure that we do not lose that momentum and that we continue to empower the superintendent and the district to serve the students of Charleston County in the best way they possibly can. And yes, Mr. Logan. Hey, good evening, everybody. My name is Craig Logan. Um, I am running as a uh, endorsed by Ms. Courtney Waters, who currently holds a seat for District 4 Board of Trustees. Um, I have extensive experience uh, grassroots organizing and community building. Um, and also, I've been on the front line here locally um, at school board meetings on a regional level and also on a state level. Uh, it's super important to me that we have uh, someone in this seat to continue the work that Ms. Waters has done for District 4. Um, I understand the importance of ensuring that teachers and staff have equitable and uh, good pay, <clears throat> and also making sure that we continue strides to close the achievement gap, specifically for all students, but definitely in District 4 too as well. Um, again, I'm excited to share a bit more with you all throughout the night about my platform. Thank you, candidates. I wanna take this opportunity to let you know that this is being live streamed on the League of Women Voters Facebook page. So if you have your phone out and you wanna share this so other people can see it, you're welcome to do so. While you're dealing with your phone, make sure it's on silent so it doesn't disrupt the process this evening. Uh, candidates, oh, and one more thing. Uh, we will be entertaining questions from the audience. If you would like to write down a question, uh, you can find somebody from the League of Women Voters. They have index cards and they will get those to you. All right. All right, candidates, you have 90 seconds to answer as we start the first round of questioning. New State Board of Education regulations prohibit schools from offering books or materials that are not age and developmentally appropriate. Completely banning materials for any age group if it includes visual depictions or descriptions of sexual conduct. In your opinion, does this definition include the books or materials of various religions. We'll start with Ms. Dunmire Roberson. In your opinion, does this definition include the books or materials of various religions? In my definition, um, it, it does include the, the definition of um, various religions. But let me expound on the regulation 43170 that just came down um, from the state. That is something that is a regulation. And I think it's important for everyone to understand that when we get regulations, that we don't have a lot of say in it, that we are to follow the regulation and make a framework for it to work in our district. We have we had the opportunity to work with our legal department as well as our learning services department to put a framework in place um, so that we can be in compliance with the new regulation 43170. Thank you. All right, Ms. Faust. Uh, in my opinion, it doesn't explicitly uh, ex have religious um, wording that would it prohibit faith but i think that the di that the district has always had a really robust reconsideration pro uh, process for parents to um, have their child uh, maybe not have certain books or materials because for whatever personal reasons that they had and the district has always had that in place um, and then also, um, I, as a school improvement council chair, I've sit, sat on reconsideration um, request from parents. So I have experience with that process and I do think that having um, that in place is valuable. Mr. Glover. My opinion about that, uh, uh, I guess with the state mandates, um, 
even coming up through school, we had biology books, we had health books, and we had to deal with the body, uh, the anatomy of, of a human. So by them coming with the, this mandate with the different books about sexual uh, explicit material, that's something we've been having since we've been coming up in school. It's already there. So my, my thing is, how are you going to learn something or anything about your body if you don't learn it in school? Sure, mom and daddy only can teach us about so much. But in school, we'd be, we be able to get into the depths of it and things that we really need to learn, especially with the generation that we have today. It is something that we really need to be focused on also because that's something, it's a need to learn thing. Um, as a parent, I, I do have two, two kids. Um, I have lost two kids. And, and, and my thing is, they need to know about life. They need to know about the anatomy of the body. They need to know about reproduction system. All of this we learned in school. So these are, maybe they're updating the information. I'm not sure, but it's something that is definitely needed in the schools, regardless of relation, I mean, regardless of religion or not. It is something that it needs to be, and it needs to start at, I think, the middle high school. Um, not at the elementary school, but I would say the middle school, at least, uh, the contents need to be taught in the schools. Mr. Allen, chair. Boy, I won't make this easy for y'all. That is a political question, and it's a political quagmire question. I can tell you my experience on the board in the past. Decisions like that that come down from the state goes through our superintendent. We're a policy-making board. We get advice from our staff who are experts in that particular area. They counsel with us in the executive session and in public session, and then we form an opinion. We do not try to interpret anything into the law other than what our staff tells us we're able to do. So therefore, for me to try to put my personal input into that, I cannot. I have to follow the rules of the law, and it has to be interpreted by staff. And then we make a decision from there. Mr. Kelly. Well, sir, if I understand the root of the question, it was, uh, I, I think I, I agree with some of the other candidates' responses. I'm not sure I see the, the similarity between a religious text and sexual content. Uh, but to answer it directly, uh, your, your question was, d does, do religious texts, uh, should religious texts be excluded because of the sexual content law? Uh, I believe the answer is no, but I've also never read any religious texts that have explicit sexual content in them. So I, I would have to say it would depend on the, the content of the book because that's the intent of the law. All right. And Mr. Logan. Uh, in my opinion, if we are, uh, again, answering your question and basing this again on uh, Regulation 43-170 that yeah, we would have to ban, ban religious books. Um, again, it, you can't pick and choose um, if this regulation is going to be implemented. Um, it has to be implemented across the board because this does come down from the state level. Mr. Calhoun. Absolutely. If we're going to, <clears throat> excuse me, first to answer your question, yes, if we, um, if we were to look at the rule of the regulation, we would absolutely have to ban, particularly the Bible, it's there. However, getting deeper down into 43-170, um, let's just talk about how it will bog down the board. You know, every community member, every community member in here had an opportunity to put up five books to be banned a month. And then it goes to the district, the district says, it's great, it's fine, it can go into the schools. Those five board, uh, those five, those community members could then send those over to the board. We have five-hour meetings right now, six-hour meetings. We had a meeting that went to 2 o'clock in the morning. If we had to go through all of those books right now, then we would be there forever. It's just going to bog down the board and distract the board from the actual work that we have to do already, that we should be doing already. Because if anybody was able to appeal that, we will be there forever. Um, now, like Ms. Roberson said, there's nothing we can do about it because we have to put some type of regulation in. And I'm glad that the, uh, the staff and the uh, administration of the district actually put something together for us. But we have to stop putting up these distractions. Thank you, sir. 
Round two, would you support a policy that allows nonprofit community-based organizations to use district facilities to provide educational programs for parents and community members at no cost? We we'll start with Ms. Dunmar Roberson. Wait a minute. I, Wait. I, I, I missed. My fault. Ms. Faust. I got ahead of myself or behind myself as it is. I'm sorry. The, and it was about uh, nonprofit. Let me, let me read it again for you. Yes. Uh, would you support a policy that allows nonprofit community based organizations to use district facilities to provide educational programs for parents and community members at no cost? Um, community partners, uh, community partnerships, wraparound services, they exist in our schools today. Um, there are numerous, numerous nonprofits who do come in and do incredible work um, for our kids, for our, all kids. Um, in terms of what the arrangements of the arrangements of the nonprofit with the district. I think that there are probably um, varying levels of, of arrangements <laughs> and to, to just provide an overarching answer maybe seems like uh, depending on the services that are provided or what type of services are provided, how many kids are being reached, um, those factors should be evaluated. Mr. Glover. Well, um, on this particular plan, I think you're taking me back to 70s, 80s, where there were after school programs, and there were programs in the schools for uh, adult education. Um, if I'm not mistaken, those, uh, those different programs, I think they were funded programs, and I think there was a cost to it if I'm not mistaken. But one thing about those programs is we're benefiting to the kids in the community, not only the kids, but the adults in the community that does not, that cannot read or cannot do math or, or, or other things that need to be learned during the school because a lot of them didn't educate from high school. They didn't get an education. So I, I think that uh, we should go back to a, a small taxation, which I, I know that it was during that particular time. So that way, whatever we have to do to educate the people in the community and our kids in the community, that's what we have to do. Um, we, we, don't, we don't need to be selling ourselves short because when, when our kids hurt, we hurt too. All right, Mr. Holland, sir. Yes, sir. Would you support a policy that allows nonprofit community-based organizations to use district facilities to provide educational programs for parents and community members at no cost? Well, currently when I was on the board, we did do that. I think one of the, one of the things that we have to make sure is the, the nonprofit, the objective, what the turnaround is supposed to be, what's the final goals, and that we have anything that's sustainable that we can turn back over to the community. One of the things that we had to do back when I was on the board the superintendent had to streamline the use of nonprofits because the district was losing millions of dollars in allocate, allocating time to nonprofits with no, no objective out goals. So I believe in sharing the school facilities with the public, but we have to make sure that the objective meets the community standards. Mr. Kelly. So, the, the short answer is yes, I would support that. I would put a couple of caveats on it, sir. Uh, first, I, uh, the priority needs to be children. Adult education is very, very important, but the buildings that we are uh, trustees over are for our students. So from a scheduling standpoint, just logistically, the, the priority needs to be students. Um, second, the, I, would, I would change the phrase no cost to no profit to the district. There are costs to buildings being open. There are lights on right now. There are janitors going to have to come through after we're done. There are tables to be set up, that kind of stuff. Uh, so I, I would fully support the district not making any money, but I believe the expense of simply 
having the building open air conditioning and all uh, should be covered by whomever it is that's occupying that building. Um, lastly, I, the, the, the statement was, was made earlier about the outcome. Uh, wraparound services is a pillar that the board is uh, is focused on, and it is something the district has already uh, already made an important uh, made importance of. So, adult education absolutely falls under wraparound services, and it is something that if we cannot find space in our current buildings or availability, that I think it's something the district should be looking at to support the students, because at the end of the day, if you're going home and you are going at home to mom and dad and asking for help on homework, but mom and dad can't read, they can't help you with your homework. So it always comes back to the students. All right, and Mr. Logan. Yes, I would support that. Um, I come from, again, grassroots organizing, and I know the importance of holistically meeting families where they are. Um, from my experience, when parents understand and know that schools, principals, teachers have their students' best interests at heart, they are more likely to be receptive of anything that that school or teacher is gonna to bring to that parent. And so um, I think as a district, we sh should be looking at community resources. We should be looking at how are we working with schools and in communities to identify uh, resources that already exist and then holistically bring those um, resources together for families and schools. So absolutely, yes. Thank you very much, Mr. Calhoun. Yes, I agree with everyone else. Um, absolutely, we should open it up. And um, I think the biggest thing, as everyone else has said, what are the outcomes that are coming from it? I work at a place to where we only have seven full-time staff there. I can't extend my staff because they have to work from nine to five all day but then also come in and say, all right, we're gonna open up the building from six to nine after work, but then have to come right back in the very next day. So what are the outcomes that are coming from it? I will absolutely support a policy to open it up for the nonprofits to come in, um, but you know, we have to have some type of guardrails around everything. Now, granted, the poli that policy would not be coming from the board. That policy would be coming from the staff that the board would approve. It's not, we, we could not put that policy forward because that would not be what's out of our board policies. But once it comes forward to the board, I would absolutely support that. Ms. dunmire Ropes. Yes, I would just like to pick up where Mr. Calhoun left. Um, it is not a board policy. Um, that This question is really an operational um, question. Um, so um, the district currently, um, it's actually working on um, putting a framework together with community-based organizations. Um, and what they're doing is actually having them to put together mutual of understandings so that they can put together their scope of work. And I believe that having that MOU in place will allow the district staff, staff particularly the finance department, to make an informed decision if that CBO will be allowed to use the district facilities for free. So that's not something that's under governance, that's more of an operational, um, uh, and it probably will fall under administrative rule under the finance department. All right, and Mr. Glover, uh, your question, Charleston leaders are, Ms. Faust, did you respond? You started, okay. Mr. Glover, Charleston leaders are considering a tax increment financing district or TIF to fund infrastructure and green space at Union Pier. The Charleston County School District will hold votes on establishing that TIF district. Would you vote in favor of it? Why or why not? How do you feel about public tax dollars being used to subsidize private development? How do you think it would hurt or help public education? Wow. Mr. Glover. Well, I think that the the taxation for the Union Pier should not uh, basically have anything to do with the educational department. The reason why is because we have state funding, we have federal funding, we have the Ports Authority. All of that should have been taken care of by then. Billions of dollars comes into Charleston. We got cruise ship that comes into Charleston in and out all through the year. Why would it have to, my question would be, why would the school district would have anything to do with something that's a state issue, or legislators and, and, and our um, political parties? 
And that's something that should be dealt with there, not, not as far as the school having a part of it or even have to even vote on that. As far as doing, have anything to do with education, sure, it's fine to learn about cruise ships and stuff, but when it comes down to costing, um, saying that it's taken away from the education of kids, I, I don't think that it is, that it would take away from the education of kids because that's something that it has always been into Charleston and um, you're taking money from the school district supporting something that's that's by the state our state legislator. All right. Mr. Hollinger. Now I'm gonna tell you. I played catch up on this particular item, but I'm gonna give you a little bit of history, okay? And then y'all can fill it in from there. I don't have enough to say I can give you a decision for or against. But I can tell you where we were when we were on the board. Lisa standing right there, sitting right there. The last TIF that we dealt with was on Highway uh, uh, San Rittenberg when Mayor Technenberg came to us and wanted a TIF there. And our finance director told us, if we approve this one, we could not afford any more TIFs. Now fast forward to today. See, the, thing, the difference between experience and knowledge, present board members do not go back to find out what happened in the past. So the question needs to, ask, to be asked, can we afford it, first of all? Second of all, I heard that the issue is that we get 75 Calhoun Street back from the city of Charleston. Now, when I was on the board, we knew the condition of that building. We knew we wanted out. Now, we need to weigh the factors with each one to see if it balances out. But to sit here and give you a 60-second question answer to this, it needs to be dug, dug, you know, dug into a little bit more. That's all I'm saying. Mr. Kelly. I'm in a similar boat to uh, Mr. Hollinshed. I, I don't have all of the information yet as it has not been presented either to the board uh, nor to the public. Um, uh, all of the details of both the IG, the intergovernmental agreement and the TIF. One of the things that has gone wrong in the past with TIFs has been that it is exclusively just the taxing district. Um, this one, as Mr. Holland had mentioned, has other perks attached to it for Charleston County School District. So there are simply too many variables that are unknown at this moment to give you a direct answer uh, uh, on, the, on the TIF topic. I, I'm, I'm neither for nor against it at this moment. I'm still in fact-finding mode, sir. Thank you, Mr. Logan. As it pertains to this TIF, this is an interesting uh, topic, uh, one of great interest to a lot of people. Um, I, I, I could not support it. And, and I think my reasoning in this is that while we know, you know, the items that are presented to the district currently, um, I don't believe that I know that there is a scheduled meeting uh, on Friday, but I don't believe the, the return on investment is going to be so great that this would be something that the district should absolutely look at doing. What I believe is that we, the district should be in the business of educating students. And when I look at the landscape of where we are right now in downtown Charleston, if you look at how this was 10, 15 years ago, um, Black and brown people are not here. And if we think about what would potentially happen, we won't be here as well. And so, again, I look at this from a standpoint of how, how, does, how would this help the community? How would this benefit people who have been in Charleston on the peninsula and they continue to be dismissed and displaced and will not even, maybe have access to the benefits of what Union Pier can bring. So for me, it would be a no. Mr. Calhoun, you smile. <clears throat> yes, because I actually have all the information on this TIF. And um, my committee, the Audit and Finance Committee that I am the chair of, denied it five, three, two, one. From that, I will tell you, I would not support this TIF. The return on investment is not there. We are not developers. We are here for education. Yes, we can get the fourth floor of 75 Calhoun, but what else would that give us over the next 30 years? 
That's a lot of tax money. We have eight other TIFs out there right now. What have we got from those eight other TIFs? Now we're looking at our money going out for the next 30 years. They looped in a couple other developments that are about to be done right now. And they can call up those bonds at any time. No, we should not be entering into this TIF. When TIFs were first created, they were created to, uh, to address blight. What is blight about Union Pier right now? That we should be giving up our tax dollars to go build up something for a billionaire, for the city, that we cannot be putting that money towards our school district. The city can stay at the top of 75 Calhoun. I don't care. They can be there till 2092. But as of right now, no, we should not be giving up our tax dollars to build up Union Pier. Ms. Dunmire Roberson. Yes, and I will just continue with Mr. Um, Calhoun. I am the vice chair of the Audit and Finance um, Committee, and I do have the information um, about this TIF, and I will not support it with the information that I have. Um, our mission, our core mission, is education. It is not development. Um, we currently have six active TIFs in the tune of $20 million. So before we get our monies, the county take off $20 million off the top. Can you imagine what we could do with $20 million? You remember that literacy I told you that was on my platform? We can actually get all of our kids reading on grade level. Do you remember that retaining and recruiting high um, quality teachers? We could use that money um, for that and closing the achievement gap. So there's so many things that we could do with those dollars before we give it away for development. Um, I don't know what else to add to that other than the fact is that CCSD is for education. The city and the county, they are for infrastructure. So of course they will sign on to it. Just because we are offered to participate in a TIF does not mean that we have to participate. We've already been gracious and we've, we've signed on onto nine. The previous boards have signed on to nine. Six are active. So we still have three that still that we need to finance. This this TIF will be number ten if the district agreed to participate. I think the taxpayers deserve better. Thank that is, you. That is time. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Faust. Yes. Um, Education of kids is the priority of CCSD. But education does cost money. And to say that we have all the information, certainly not as a sitting board member of the last audit and fi finance committee that um, Darlene and Darren are referencing had 1.5 hours of executive session of discussion. So as a, not a person who is privy to that information, certainly do not have all of the information around the TIF. There is an additional, it's been referenced, meeting for more financial information to be presented at a meeting tomorrow um, to the Audit and Finance Committee. And I look forward to seeing the information as, as a public person um, that explains how this TIF could help with teacher pay, increasing teacher pay, and educational outcomes for our kids. So I'm going to hold off on making a decision until we have that information. All right. Another round of questions. This question will be a hybrid question. It is part of our question that we have prepared. And um, we'll tack on a portion from the audience as well. So the question reads, more and more frequently, school board members are running as a block. It's not new. What are the pros and cons of this approach? And what organizations endorse you? Mr. Hollinshed. Wow. Well, I can honestly tell you, anybody that knows me, I'm a lone wolf. Nobody endorses me. I'm not running with a block. I think you got two sets, two sets of groups up here represented by two, two organizations. Um, I'm, I'm independent. I represent you. I don't represent any cliques. Let me tell you, let, let me just be honest with you. Every time, going back to John Busson, every time you deal with these people that come out with PACs, look at the bottom line. This is a $1 billion organization, and they're trying to get their hands on the money. And I'll say this again. Y'all ain't going to stop till you're behind to end up in damn jail. 
All right, Mr. Kelly. So running as a block, the, human nature is to surround yourself with people who think like you. That is a normal thing. Uh, we, we, we would find that in this very building on a Sunday morning, I would venture to guess. Uh, Like-minded folks do tend to, to flock to, to each other. Um, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna say this because it's true and then I'm gonna tell you the rest of it. So I'm not currently endorsed by anybody that I'm aware of. However, in the past, and I believe it, it very may likely happen again, the Charleston County Republican Party as well as Moms for Liberty has endorsed me. Um, so I just wanna be transparent with that, but as far as I know, that, that hasn't happened this, this time around. Um, so to the point about, your question was, is it helpful for people to run as a block? Uh, as any body politic, it takes a, uh, a majority of votes to accomplish things. And so, if you have like-minded folks who all are voted by individual uh, voters across the entire county, and the county decides as a, as a voter block, democratically speaking, that they want that type of person to be making decisions for their school system, then absolutely it makes sense to run as a block, which is why I run with other family value conservative folks. If you were, you said you ran with Moms or Moms for Liberty, they endorsed you before. If yes, they were the, to the, offer again, would you accept? In the 2022 race, uh, yes or they did. If they were to offer again, would you accept? Absolutely. All right, Mr. Logan. Yes, sir. So uh, <clears throat> currently I uh, have endorsements by the current board seat holder, Courtney Waters, uh, the Charleston branch of the SCEA and the state level branch and Charleston County uh, Democratic Party. Um, and what I'll say to that is uh, what I know is that uh, it's important for specifically this board to ensure that we put students in education first. And um, understanding how boards work and how governing bodies work, um, it is important also to ensure that there is a body of people on boards that stand behind putting education and putting children first. And so what we've seen over the past course of years, particularly on the board, is that it has been a very politicized board and it has become a very political issue that oftentimes takes away putting children in education first. So for me, so I'll, you know, to answer that, um, it, to me it is important to make sure that there are like-minded people on the board that stand on the ground of continuing to put students and education first. Mr. Calhoun. Thank you. Um, I believe I am endorsed by everyone that uh, Mr. Logan is uh, endorsed by right now, which would be Charleston County Democratic Party, as well as the um, South Carolina Education Association and their local branch. But when we start looking at running as a block, I think it's completely different when you actually get on the board and start thinking about voting as a block. You have to be able to come inside of that boardroom with all the information and come up with something that is best for the students. And I think over the last two years, that's something that we, not we, but uh, that we have, but um, something that many people have come away from. I've had many times where I'll be inside the back uh, coming out of executive session, I'll have one person who say, oh, this is absolutely nuts. But then we come out into the front and they vote completely different, knowing that the information that they were presented was not the same as what they, uh, what they were going to vote for. Voting as a block, that is what has been tearing up this board as, a, uh, uh, as we are here right now, without looking at all the information that we have, what we know is best for the students, yet coming out and doing something different. You care to mention any names? I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> I'll tell you. No, 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 no. That's, that's, that's my fault. All right, Ms. Dunmire Roberson, forgive me. Yeah, I'm glad that Mr. Callan was able to um, really straighten out that question because you don't run as a block, um, but there's block voting. Um, so 
Again, my endorsement is the same as Mr. Logan and Mr. Calhoun. I've been endorsed by the Charleston County Democratic Party, as well as the South Carolina Education Association and their local branch, Charleston County Education Association. Um, I look forward to hopefully um, being endorsed by um, other organizations as well. Now, Mr. Calhoun has said, we've talked about this many times. You may have served on boards and you may have seen other boards, but until you have served on a board with Moms for Liberty, you've not served like we have. This has been extremely difficult. Um, we try to work across um, the aisles. We try to keep our students centered. We try to make sure we make informed decisions. But one thing um, can turn into another. We come out thinking that we are all on the same page. And then when there's time for a vote, there's a block vote. And that's what you've been witnessing. And this is very dangerous. So when you see four people that's running um, in, in the same organizations, they're endorsing us, it's because we hold the same values, the same that is, educational values. That is time, Ms. Rose. And we put education over politics. <clears throat> Ms. Faust. Yes. Uh, I'm not, run I'm running for not to serve myself or any organization. Um, and I believe that two years ago when the district went to single member districts, it opened some, I, I believe the school board membership should be, the school board race should be nonpartisan. And that two years ago when we moved to single mem member districts, that contributed to having to put Republican endorsements and Democratic endorsements in the school board race. In this particular race, um, the Democratic Party had candidates in the seat that I'm running. I am uh, therefore um, working with the Republican Party and that is the only endorsement, I'm not even sure that's an endorsement, um, but that is the only endorsement. I'm not seeking endorsements from any party, again, because I believe some of the frustration from both sides up here around perceptions of voting or groups of voting or blocks um, really starts with how we run and how we put ourselves in groups before we even get on the board. And again, I, I think that single member districts in some way contributed to that fact today. Mr. Glover. Yes, that's one thing I really don't want to get caught up into being endorsed by a certain organization and stuff because they have the tendency of, they say, we're jerking the chain or having control of you or getting you to do a uh, vote on different things that they want you to do. I I'm all about, I'm a people person. I've served in my community. I've served in politics since 1984. I worked under two sheriff, Chuck Dolly, Sheriff Cannon, and I served presently 16 years in the constituent board chair, 10 years. And so my thing is, I prefer uh, supporting myself. If the people want a true leader and the leadership of a true person, then they would vote for the person that taking care of them or supporting their needs or making sure that things are being done in their district as somebody that they can count on, not somebody that's being bought out. That, that just me. And one thing about me, I, um, I'm a worker. I do what needs to be done in my community. And one thing for sure, my kids' education come first. And then the main problem that I have now that the school system is really failing to deal with right now because they have been shooting in various school is mental health. That's my main topic. And I will drive it in the ground because if we don't get a hold of it now, there's going to be a disaster here in our district. Thank don't take it for granted because it can't happen here. And that's something we really need to focus on as parents, as teachers, as a board. That's what we need to do. Thank you, Mr. Glover. Are you endorsed by anyone? All right, thank you. All right. I believe I will take a short break to remind everyone that we are in a church sanctuary. And I would just remind us all to be mindful of that and to reverence the building. Thank you. Another question.
This one will start with um, Mr. Kelly. District data makes clear that there are schools serving high poverty areas struggling to succeed. The data also documents long-standing disparities among outcomes for black, brown, and white students. What can the school board do about these issues? With the invent, or uh, with the uh, addition of weighted student formula this year, uh, we are allowing building level leaders to make decisions that are right for their schools. A school in West Ashley, North Charleston, the Peninsula, Mount Pleasant, that e each need something unique and different. And the failed policies, the failed way that this was done in the past of trying to slam a size 10 shoe on everyone's foot and one size fit all simply has failed. Allowing, going closer to what was when we were coming up, where there were community schools and the, and the school in your community meant something, and giving that local bit, the, the local principal the ability to make decisions for their school, that is going to be massively impactful for these uh, community schools that, that have population, uh, student populations who are struggling. So to answer your question directly, sir, proper resourcing, which is something we've just brought forward this year. Thank you very much, Mr. Logan. <clears throat> yeah, um, I think what can the board do to support disparities in data? Um, I think number one, the board can ensure that uh, they operate in, in truthfulness and um, transparency and I think also you know as Mr. Kelly mentioned you know the uh, student weighted, weighted formula um, is going to be a game changer because it is going to um, identify those factors students in poverty students with disabilities multilingual learners and identify what resources are needed to ensure that across the board every student has a a uh, customized plan that is gonna allow them to, um, again, make those bounds and leaps. And so I think it is working with staff. I think it is working with the chief academic officer. I think it is ensuring that there are a number of resources, not only from a financial standpoint, but again, looking at the holistic aspect. How are we meeting families? How are we meeting students where they are? Uh, what community resources are out there that can be bridged with some of the things that I mentioned to ensure that the specific needs of each student, specifically in districts of high disparities, are met. Thank you, sir. Mr. Calhoun. I love this question. Um, as everyone knows, we've made great strides, but we're nowhere where we need to be at this point. Um, one of the best strides we've made was hiring a great CAO, a chief academic officer, who can get us to where we need to be. Um, we fought for that, and it was hard, but we fought for that, and I'm so glad that we have her in place. We've fought for a quality, standardized curriculum. We, we need that. Without the consistency within the curriculum, then our kids will be going up and down, up and down, up and down, and that's nowhere where our district should be. We have the professional learning communities, when we have the training for our, uh, for our uh, staff, as, uh, for our teachers, as well as our staff. They need that so they can be right for our students. So that gets back down to us funding everything that they need, which gets down to the last point, listening to the professionals. Some of us are educational professionals, but they actually went to school for what they do. And they come to us and say, this is what I need. And as long as we can give them the funding to be able to do what they need to do, let's make it happen because as long as they are giving us the, um, the results that we need. Ms. Dunmire Roberson. Okay, I'm going to take a quick second to um, respond to something. And being endorsed by an um, organization, I have been in, in 2022, I was endorsed by nine organizations. None of them asked me for anything. Organizations that endorse you is because you believe in the same values um, regarding education. Let me answer the question. I have a bachelor's degree in psychology, a master's degree in education with a specialization in school counseling. I have 38 years of educational um, uh, and education in the background in education and counseling. We can talk about um, 
experienced teachers, the weighted student formula, high quality curriculum, um, targeted strategies. But my belief is that in order for us to close this achievement gap, and especially in our rural areas and our low income, we have to address early childhood education. We have to get these kids in schools early. We have to make sure that they are um, have access to um, the reading early and all the strategies um, that these other kids in high income areas have. And the ultimate goal is to have universal early childhood education. I believe that once we focus on that, we will start seeing a difference. Until then, I believe that we will continue to see small gains, early childhood education. Ms. Faust. Yes. Well, I don't disagree with many of the things that were already brought up, weighted student budget, early childhood education, curriculum. I believe that research shows that teachers, high quality teachers, are the greatest predictor of student achievement. We have to invest in our teachers. Not only that, we have to empower them with resources and support because they, then they will bring equity to the classroom. And um, all of the other things are, uh, contribute to that, but number one, investing in teachers. CCSD, when you drop your kids off at school, and I drop my son kid off at, kiddo off at school in the morning, they wear t-shirts a lot, and they have on their door that students are the heart of our work. That's their motto. But teachers are the ones who bring the heart to life in the classroom. They are the ones who are doing this work. And so simply investing in high quality teachers. Mr. Glover. Can I get you to repeat that question? Absolutely. District data makes clear that, that's, yes. Yes, district data makes clear that there are schools serving high poverty areas struggling to succeed. The data also document longstanding disparities among outcomes for black, brown, and white students. What can the school board do about these issues? Well, one thing they need to do is put more funding into the school um, that would provide them with the necessary materials that they need to teach the kids and cut down on the uh, amount of students in the classroom because um, I know it was up to 25 students in a class versus one teacher. And that does not work in a learning environment for kids. You're not gonna learn properly because how can one teacher uh, gain the attention of 25 kids in a classroom and making sure that everybody is on the same is on the same page. That's not going to happen. There's some assistance that's needed there. And I also want to go back again while I got the 30 seconds. Um, it also comes to put together a continuous plan. A plan with your faculty and staff members will bring any school up to date if you got the correct plan. Kudos, Margarita Middleton. I was a uh, vice president of PTA. Mini Huge Elementary School was the only school in Charleston County that closed the achievement gap for 10 consecutive years for a Charleston County school district. And we did not have early childhood. We had teachers. All right. Mr. Hollinshed. I'm gonna go straight to um, a scenario when I was on the board. The achievement gap is something that has to be addressed in everything in poverty areas. When I was on the board, homeless students were at 81. Today, guess what that number is? 241. I said it earlier, we need to have transitional homes that take parents off of the streets and place them into an environment where the child can feel comfortable and to be able to get tutored and educated and also work with the parent to get them structured back into affordable housing. That helps the teacher in the classroom when the child knows he has a place to go at night and to be able to concentrate on schoolwork. That number went from 81 to the day 241. And it's keeping, it's, and it keeps growing. So those are areas that we don't look at when we talk about poverty areas and achievement gap. But I, that hit me personally because I had a young man at a hotel uh, in front of churches begging me for money, a friend of mine, and we gave him money, and they were trying to get money up to pay for their hotel room. So think about those who are less fortunate. 
Thank you, sir. I'm going to call an audible right here. I'm going to ask all the candidates to stand up for 30 seconds. Give me 30 seconds on the clock. We're going to stretch, take a drink of water, <laughs> and we'll be right back at this time out. <laughs> And we're back. If there are any audience members who have questions, I want to extend that opportunity to you. We have some, but I've got a whole book of questions. If you don't want to hear my questions all night, by all means, please uh, submit your own. We've got one from the audience, and this one we start with Mr. Logan. Uh, how would you handle the many teacher vacancies in our school district? Well, um, A, just understanding teachers and understanding the um, great job, the important job that teachers have. Um, I've, mom is an educator, I know a, a lot of educators and, and it's tough being a teacher, right? And so um, I would, a listen to teachers, um, but then also, again, as I've advocated for increased teacher pay, um, look at how are we meeting teachers where they are. Um, it's hard, you know, teachers oftentimes go to work, uh, some have, have, have kids themselves, um, and some have to take off to go to doctor's appointments or to go to school appointments and things of that nature. So again, there are a number of practices and things that are happening across the across the nation um, that uh, are putting teachers first and really identifying kind of what the needs of teachers are, right? Um, half days and, and, and schedule kind of breaks for teachers. So I think it is number one, listening to the voices and the concerns of teachers, but then also strategically working to make sure that um, as a board, we can then implement and put those things in place for teachers. And I think that would help in the decrease of vacancies. Mr. Calhoun. Yes, to address that directly, um, teacher vacancies at this point, we don't have any. And that's because we were able to re increase that pay. Now, starting that way is one thing, but we need to end that way uh, at the same uh, in the same time. Um, how do we do that? Giving them the professional development that they need so they can feel as if we are supporting them to succeed, to get them to move up into where they want to be at. Continue to increase pay. We've built in raises over the next five to, t uh, five to seven years within our five-year strategy in order to be able to bring them up to where we want them to be at, or where they need to be at, to be able to live inside of Charleston County, um, giving them the time that they need, uh, giving them the resources that they need, be it uh, through the classified staff. Teachers are not the only people inside that building. We need to be able to bring our classified staff up as well, who actually support our teachers uh, by raising their salaries as well. So there are a multitude of things that we can bring forward to help um, keep the vacancies low, because at this point, we're good, but at, how, how will we look at the end of the year if we have 20, 30 vacancies when we started off with none? Ms. Dunmire Robers. Yes, we are very fortunate to start this year with zero um, teacher vacancy, and it was because of the bonuses that we gave um, last year 
um, the $5,000 bonus and the um, $5,000 teacher pay increase, and then this year, the $8,000. So that really helps. So the, the issue is at hand is retention. And like Mr. Calhoun said, making sure that we have professional development in place for them, as well as re uh, recognition programs um, and bonuses for them. Teachers need to be recognized and, and um, be told that they're doing a great job. Mentorships um, programs uh, for our new teachers, making sure that they, when they come in that they have someone that will be there to um, coach them. So that's something that is, um, will be a great help for retention, um, as well as continuing the teacher pay and then um, making sure we pay attention um, to their mental health and wellness. Ms. Faust. Yeah. Um, teacher pay is a huge start. I think there's more conversation that should continue um, with teacher input around how to con continue to head in that, in that uh, direction. Providing places where folks want to work. We all get to choose where we want to work, and I don't think it's different by having leadership, school leadership, that has a culture where teacher input is taken into account at building level decisions um, inside of the building. People want to work in places where they feel like they understand what the goals are, the objectives, and that they're part of the decision making for the next steps. Um, there are things that teachers also um, honoring teachers as professionals, and some of that is as we've come out of COVID and, and other professions, folks have flexible work schedules, which is probably not all possible for teachers, but there are things we can do to allow teachers to um, be included in their own children's events at school during the school day um, and ways honoring holidays that the traditional school calendar may not take into account some religious um, holidays of other faiths and allowing teachers to have time off to do those kind of things um, are all ways to retain. And then in 10 seconds, I would just say that that's just about retention. There's a whole line of work that has to do about recruiting folks into the field. Mr. Glover. Yes, I am, I'm so glad for the, the, the additional funding that was paid to the teachers because I basically, I was just tired of opening up the school year with 10 to 15 teachers short, opening up school year. And, and, and it tells me that one thing, people's not gonna travel far out in the rural area uh, just for a little pay and doesn't get no type of incentives. So we gradually, argued the point about incentives, so teachers was given incentives. So fast forward from 10 years up to now, basically we were down to two students, uh, I think it was on the last year. And this school year here, um, we pretty much opened up with all the teachers that we need. So uh, I'm thankful for uh, what they have done um, in, in, as school board and as of the state allocating the funding and stuff. So uh, I'm, I'm thankful for it and um, we can do more. We can. Um, teachers, coaches, and we also got uh, better guidance, guidance counselors and stuff in, in the school. And, and my main thing that they left out, we need to get our mental health in tech. We do have a mental health person, but when we have a backlog of 35 and 40 students, that bothers me because there is a problem there and there's an issue that, that needs to be addressed. And long as they don't address that issue, we're gonna have a major problem. And so therefore, that's one thing I feel that we need to deal with now. Um, if appointed to the board, that's one thing I will address. And Mr. Hollinshed. Well, I would agree there's no vacancies now. But let me tell you back in time, when the former superintendent back then, Jarita Postal, we gutted the system, our teachers went through a lot of trouble, a lot of grief, a lot of heartache. Teachers were leaving the district in droves. Now, as God does things in time, to bring about Mr. Kennedy, then Anita Huggins, and they unleashed the door. They increased it. The teachers pay to well make teachers comfortable, but you gotta understand what the teacher goes through. A lot of times they cannot leave their, their classroom for a break, to even relieve themselves and things like that. We have to continue on building to help teachers feel more comfortable within the classroom so they can perform at a high rate. They're human. And they, you know, sometimes they need a little break. They need to, you know, to cry for a second, take a breather, and then go back in the classroom. 
Another thing we need to do is we need to work on legacy building within the classroom. We need to build from within. I can remember, and, and I'm going to tell you, the current superintendent, I remember when Jarita placed her in the closet on 75 Calhoun Street. Look where God took her at today. She's the superintendent. Look what she did. She came back and she blessed her teachers because she knew what she came, she came through. You know, something that we all have to remember, the history that we came through and what God's brought us to today. Mr. Kelly. I'm not sure there's a single thing I've heard that I disagree with tonight on this question. Uh, the, the fact that we started this school year with zero classroom vacancies was a first in CCSD history and not something uh, that, that, that should be overlooked. Uh, we have a phenomenal recruiting team. The question was to the board specifically, what would you do to support teacher vacancies? One of the things that, that wasn't mentioned this evening was we also include, uh, increased the steps. So where we had teachers who were 30 years in and had no incentive to stay, uh, we were able to increase the step from 30 up to 40. So those teachers who had history could stick around to teach those who were a bit younger and needed some of that uh, mentorship that was spoken about earlier. We've also done uh, child care for teachers in the district at very little cost to them so that they, uh, uh, if they have a working spouse or no spouse, and they, they can bring their child to work at uh, very little cost to them and, uh, and, and have their child looked after um, in an early childhood type of scenario. The other piece that I'm really excited about uh, is duty-free lunches. To Mr. Hollinshed's point, everyone needs to use a restroom a time or two, and uh, there are at least a few times a week that every teacher gets to have an entire lunch period to themselves. All right. Uh, without is, students, that is. That is time. Uh, one last question I'd like to ask, and it kind of piggybacks on that and uh, some of the issues that Mr. Glover uh, talked about, uh, violence in schools, um, mental health. Our guidance counselors that are in the schools, are they being used appropriately, in your opinion, in your view, or are they spending more time doing administrative tasks than they are actually attending to the mental well-being of our children? Mr. Calhoun. That's a really interesting question. I would have to look deeper into that. I, I know there are some counselors who are wrapped around everywhere within the schools. Now, every school is different. Burke is not the same as Wando. West Ashley is not the same as North Charleston. And each demographic of our students needs somebody specialized, able to deal with them. Um, are they doing what we think we need them to do? I would have them answer that. And then they come to us and tell us what they need. It's, it's hard for us sitting up at 75 Calhoun and saying, our, our counselors are not doing what's right for our children right here, because we're not in the schools every day. We can be in the schools a lot, of time, a lot of the times of the week. We can have parents tell us, but what, are, what, what do they feel as if they need? And then once they tell us that, then we can try to put the resources in place for them to, to move forward. Um, I, would, I would definitely leave that to professionals, particularly Ms. Roberson, because that's what she did. <laughs> That's what she does. A great segue into Ms. Rovers. Yes, um, we have an excellent um, learning services department and under them, under that department is led by our um, CAO. We have counselors in our school, school counselors. We have social workers in our schools. We have psychologists in our schools. We have mental health workers in our schools and each one they, uh, they actually um, work in different areas. Do we have enough? No. And so 
that's where the community-based organizations come into play, where we contract out to mental, um, the Department of Mental Health um, and different agencies that can offer other services that we, can, uh, we don't have on a um, rotating basis in our schools. So um, I believe that CCSD is doing an excellent job um, in providing these mental health services. The issue is because of Pan the pandemic, the level of depression, the level of anxieties, the school shootings, there's so many things that's happening now that's affecting our students as well as our teachers. And so we have, um, you know, the uh, we don't have all of the resources there on a full-time basis, but we are using um, community-based organizations to provide additional wraparound services. Spouse. And I believe the question was around guidance during administrative functions. Um, so it was shocking to me as a parent how much testing guidance counselors are responsible for, how much time it takes um, to conduct uh, meetings around testing and um, IEPs for students. And so it is really difficult for me to see how outside of those functions there's much time left. Um, we have social workers and psychologists who are supporting three elementary schools of 800 kids, 700 kids, 1,000 kids, and they're supporting three schools, not one. Um, so just to put it in, in kind of terms like that, I think the weighted student funding will help allow school level leaders to bring in more adults um, to uh, help with even very young early learners who um, may have disruptive students in the class, more adults in the building to um, do things like restorative practices and um, some other second step, other programs that are in the building to reduce disruptions and sort of get a hold on things at a very early age. Mr. Glover. Uh, me personally, um, from serving in my district, that's been one of the biggest problems that I've been having. Augering, batten, batten to get more of and that's mental health counselors. We have one, but one person can't handle it because of the fact that he goes from different schools. And when you got a backlog of 45 students, then you're defeating the purpose of having one there because by the time you get halfway, you could have had a major event that have taken place. So why is it that we can't have a psychiatrist in the school or mental health counselor in the school or more than one to catch up on the backlog? Because as the school year go on, the line gets longer. So therefore, we need to find a way of getting more funding into the schools. I don't know about other schools, but I know my district. I serve in the district and I've been in the schools. I know this for a fact. We needed to have where we have more, more counselors in the school where we can figure out what's going on with the students that have these issues. Because I know for a fact, the last time I checked, it was 45 students that are waiting in line to see a counselor and that has not been addressed yet. And those persons that are waiting needs to have the attention of somebody here to hear what they have to say. And when you're constantly not getting or uh, giving them the attention that they need, then we're gonna have problems. Thank you. Ms. Tollingshire. Well, I think everybody's in agreement about more counselors. I think Ms. Robertson actually um, depicted that a minute ago. But I'm gonna tell you about something that I did many years ago when I was on the board. I self-funded a trip to Atlanta, Georgia. George, you was on that trip. We went to go see some schools that were very successful. Coretta Scott King Academy for Girls, Best Academy for Boys in Spring Elementary. Coretta Scott Academy for Girls and Best Academy for Boys had wraparound services and counselors within the school. The boys were graduated 80%. The girls were graduating 99% and made national news. So you could take scenarios like that and we can incorporate that here in Charleston County. We're moving toward that direction in Charleston County, but it's not gonna happen overnight. We have to look at examples like that in Atlanta, Georgia, 
in a high poverty area and try to reduplicate those kind of things here within Charleston. Mr. Kelly. If I understood the question correctly, sir, was, it, I, I don't believe that anyone on the board is, uh, is qualified to answer if counselors are using their time wisely. Uh, I, I don't think that was the question. Are, would you mind are, repeating are they it then? Being, uh, I'll try to paraphrase. I didn't write that one down. Uh, are they being used appropriately uh, to address mental health in the schools? Personally, I've heard a lot of them having to deal with administrative tasks. Uh, testing and, and other things that are not directly involved with the student's mental well-being. Okay, I, that, that's where I was, uh, okay, terrific, thank you. So, so the way that a teacher, or the way that a counselor uh, spends a day, uh, spends a time in a school day, is the building level leader's decision. So if the principal thinks that the counselor is overworked, that is where the weighted student formula comes in. I've spoken with a number of counselors who are a number of principals rather who have said that they are going to bring in uh, additional social workers and school counselors because that's what their their student population needs. So the the what the board can do in when it comes to counselors is to continue to fund the weighted student formula and allow those principals to make the decisions that are appropriate for their buildings. Thank you. And Mr. Logan yeah, I mean, I, I dare not speak on, you know, a counselor's uh, role in their day-to-day -day, uh, job titles and duties um, because I, I just don't know what that is, right? But what I do know is um, what the board could do is listen and, and, and constantly listen. Um, and um, what I also know, too, as well, is, you know, those wraparound services, those after-school programs, um, they're so important when it comes to students' mental health and um, being a, an extension of your, um, your, your academic day, but having the ability to connect with even the most problem student from experience and um, not in a school setting, um, but just to, you know, be a listening ear or just to be able to offer guidance. Those things are so important, and I believe um, those are as important um, as the job and duties of a guidance counselor. Um, I also know that, you know, typically it's not many guidance counselors in schools compared to the number or the ratio of students in schools. And so, as it's been mentioned, you know, having those outside services come in, that's definitely important as well. Um, so again, just thinking about it from a perspective of listening first um, and then working to uh, take those concerns from guidance counselors to make sure that they're addressed. Ladies and gentlemen, please give our panelists, our candidates rather, a round of applause for this evening. <laughs> and keep it going for our timekeeper. She was on it. I appreciate the, the respect and the thoughtful answers that everyone gave. We are now moving on to closing statements. Uh, before we do though, I did get some questions from the audience. Late, I asked for these a long time ago. So I will read them and you will have 60 seconds in your closing argue or closing statements, excuse me, Mr. Logan, we'll start with you. I'll read them. If you choose to address them, that's fine. If not, it's your 60 seconds. How do you feel about book banning? What is the public benefit of private school board meetings? COVID has affected the world in some negative ways. However, virtual learning was a plus during this time and technology. Our kids seem unprepared for in-person interaction, interactions. Excuse me. How can this be addressed? Your closing statements, we start with Mr. Logan and work our way back towards Mr. Calhoun. Man, 60 that's, seconds. It's, it's a loaded question, man. <laughs> three of um, them. Three of them. Um, I won't answer all of them because questionnaires are coming out. So I'll say go to those questionnaires because a lot of those questions are on the questionnaires. Um, but what I will say is that I stand beside and behind uh, the freedom to read. And I know that books are an escape for students. I know that books for myself have allowed me to understand myself and understand situation and issue that I've dealt with. And so um, I dare not stand to ban books. Um, 
Um, but what I will say again is that I've been in this fight for a long time. I've showed up at 75 Calhoun consistently. I've, I've testified both on a local state um, level and um, I've been in the community and, and I know what the needs are for my district. And I believe that I am the best person for this role um, as school board to represent District 4. So thank you all for allowing me to be here tonight. Thank you, sir. Mr. Kelly. <laughs> I ran two years ago to ensure that I left a legacy for my grandchildren here in Charleston County that I would be proud of and that my father and grandfather would be proud of. And I've continuously been an advocate for the students in our county. And so I would ask you tonight to allow us to continue the momentum that we've built, the gains that we've seen, the teachers that we've hired, I would ask the voters in Mount Pleasant, Awandah, McClellanville, the islands, if you like the direction that our district is going, continue to support conservative family values and vote for Ed Kelly. Ms. Tollinger. Well, first of all, I wanna thank you for taking the time to listen to me. I knew I looked mean, but I'm a real big teddy bear, but you know, I think before us, you know, when you talk about book banning and those things, I'm not gonna get into political quagmire or things that an administration should be handling. But what I will tell you this as, as adults within this room, the school board politics has gotten out of hand. I said no about three, 30 times before I decided to run. No, I didn't have the endorsement of <laughs> my school board member in my area that doesn't attend any meetings in my community, but I have people in my community that came to me and asked me to run. What we need to understand is the school district and all governments within Charleston County are connected. The politics that the school district played caused havoc on county council. We had a democratic majority on county council with Teddy Pryor. We lost that. That's time. Thank you, Mr. Allen Shea. Mr. Glover. Yes. Um, I don't, I don't believe we need to have a ban on books, but one thing we need to do, we need to bring more Jesus in the school than, than books, because that's one thing that they've taken out of school and that's where our school hurt at because of the fact that nobody's allowed to pray in the morning or say the Pledge of Allegiance. You can say the Pledge of Allegiance, but you can't pray. And that's something that needs to go back into the school. We need to get more hell out of the school than bring more hell in the school. And as far as a lot of time we have, you know, election that we, we've lost so much. I, I've, I've been in the field for a long time and it, politics is nothing new to me. This, this is something that I do. Worked with the best of the best, knowing the best in Charleston County. And my thing as a school board member, um, even dealing with folks in county council, that, that, that's something that we need to strive on because they play a big part in our district, uh, even with that is time, sir. Our constituents. Thank you, Ms. Faust. I'm running to serve kids, families, and educators. I'm not running for myself or to serve any um, group. And I believe that in order to have strong schools that anchor communities, it has to be done together. I would say to um, voters in District 8 that I have experience in bringing people together. It is a skill to listen to viewpoints who may not align with yours or who um, you disagree. But listening to move is an important attribute of, the, of a board member. And I, I, I have that skill. I've been honing that skill for 12 years doing work with my community around public education. For the questions that were asked, they very transparent on my website, FOST for CCSD, and you can reach out to me there. Thank you, Ms. Robeson, Dunmire, Dunmire Robeson, I'm sorry. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you this evening. I really enjoyed being able to share my platform with you. To answer the question about book banning, I am an advocate for the freedom to read. I believe that any books and banning um, should be held and left to the education um, specialists um, and those that work in the school system. 
they know which books are um, development, developmentally appropriate and age appropriate. And we should leave that to the, um, the professionals. In regards to the COVID, I was working with the Honorable Henry Darby when COVID happened and we were responsible for transitioning our kids back to school. That was a first, No, there were no blueprints. And so the district did the best that they could to get these kids back into the school. And I believe that um, they did a, a really good job. Were there, again, no blueprints. So they did the best that they could to get the kids back into school. I am Darlene Dunmire Roberson. I am the incumbent for District 8. To find out more about my platforms, please time. visit my website at www.dunmireforschoolboard.com. Mr. Calhoun. Peace. <clears throat> as far as book banning, absolutely not. I am a historian. I understand the playbook of where book banning will take us, and we will not go back there. Um, as far as the private school board meetings, as everyone knows, if you ask me a question, I will tell you anything that is not um, uh, covered under executive session. I will tell you, we will not have that on the board, on the board that I sit on. Everybody, uh, I am as transparent as they come, and I will continue to bring transparency to this board. I, this is very personal for me. I have a daughter that is in public schools now. She's three years old in 3K. And my wife is, that's crazy, right? Uh, my wife is a teacher. And I, this is very personal for me. And we will take away this dysfunction from the school board if it is the last thing that I do. We will take away this dysfunction and actually get some work done. So please vote for me, Darren Lee Calhoun II for um, Charleston County School District 6. Thank you, candidates. Thank you, audience. For taking the time out to come tonight. We have tried to be sensitive to your time. We encourage you to study these issues very carefully and learn about the positions of each candidate and vote for the candidate of your choice on November 5th. Early voting starts October 21st. Check your voter registration status and your polling locations on scvotes.gov. And again, candidate information and answers to questions for all the races can be found at the League of Women Voters website. What is it? Vote411.org. Please hold one second where I bring Ms. Lisa King up for closing remarks. Thank you everyone for being here. Um, we appreciate all the work um, that the candidates are doing and coming. I appreciate that we know you've had many invitations, but we thank, we feel special that you've accepted ours. I'd be remiss in thanking the, the many organizations that collaborated with us to put this on, and we thank you again. Please, this was to be informative for you. Don't take this information and just sit on it. We need you to share it. Thanks so much to, to Paula and working with us, and to Mar Dr. Marguerite Archie Hudson, a round of applause for her for really, really working hard on this. She has put her heart in this. And now we ask, before you leave, please, Take one of these um, survey sheets. We need you to do that. If you don't get the sheet, we have the QR code up here. If you can focus on that and get that. We really need your feedback because we'd like to continue to offer these things um, for our community. Again, thank you and have a good night. <laughs>